Welcome to the second in the series of movie, Movies Matter uh, talks uh, connected to the film series that I programmed for this season on heroic journeys, black film histories on screen. If you don't have that flyer, uh, wonderfully created by Christine Girardi, all you have to do is go onto the museum website uh, Niagara Falls History Museums.ca, and you will find the flyer there and uh, the schedule of films and the list of talks, everything you need to know. So, as our second talk, um, <clears throat> I'm dealing with the role of the National Film Board of Canada. I'm going to use the short form, the NFB, sometimes the board, uh, so I don't have to use that long name. It's a documentary institution in Canada. In fact, it's the oldest continuing documentary filmmaking institution in the world. It was legislated into existence in 1939, and what that legislation did was to give the NFB its mandate, and here I quote from the legislation, to create films designed to help Canadians understand the ways of living and the problems of Canada. Now the NFB is a government agency and what that means when it was established, its physical plant in Ottawa, is that it had an arm's length distance from the uh, federal government. Unlike the CBC, which is a crown corporation and so, you know, over the years, you would hear MPs from time to time wanting to dismantle and get rid of the CDC, and a few of them the NFB. Just that distinction, government agency as opposed to a crown corporation. Now, the NFB was founded under John Grierson, a Scot invited to Canada, uh, who also was the film board's first commissioner from 1939 to 1940. He was also simultaneously the head of the Wartime Information Board. In other words, he was a very powerful man and had the ear of the Prime Minister. So in those first years, 1939 to 45, really, the NFB was formed to construct, create wartime propaganda films, uh, recruitment films, uh, war bond drives. <clears throat> And here in this image, you can see Grierson himself, always a cigarette in hand. Uh, he is uh, in the one of the studios where these um, wonderful posters are being constructed by brilliant graphic artists. You see one of these recruitment films, um, different kinds of caps, headgear, representing um, the armed services as well as um, the lay society, women uh, who would become factory workers, uh, farmers, and uh, train engineers, etc. And notice that they're all saluting. There are no faces, they're all saluting, and the idea is that you as a Canadian fill in. Here is uh, a poster um, on selling, promoting, war-saving bonds. Uh, it's very flirty. Uh, me and my war-saving bonds are just like this, uh, winks the uh, young uh, woman illustrated. They're good things to have and to hold. And I'm very fond of this, <clears throat> pardon me, of this calendar uh, that was issued by um, a Montreal brewery company. Um, and it used the image of, um, that obviously came from the Wartime Information Board of three spiffy looking service women marching forward. Let's all do more to win the war. And this is dated October um, 1944. I do like the tearaway uh, monthly calendar with Fish Fridays all indicated appropriate for the Catholic province of Quebec. Now these early films were what are known as short form documentary films. That is, they were under 50 minutes. Typically we associate feature length documentary with um, 50 minutes and over. 
So these short form documentary films in those early years focused on ordinary people beyond the wartime propaganda films. The point of view or grand narrative in these cultural films on ordinary people was selling a pan-Canadian ideology. In other words, Canadians across the country shared common values. That was the ideology, Anglophone or Francophone. And small towns in some of these cultural films simultaneously created uh, along, uh, in the same period as the propaganda films, saw small towns as ideal communities. There's one film that is an absolute construction around a fictional uh, town in Ontario called Maple, of course. Now the films on immigrants, the imagery in these films showed clean, God-fearing, hard-working people. The messages were shaped by voiceover narrations and music. Why God-fearing, clean, hard-working immigrants? It was a method of railing against the um, notion, and it was a highly, um, you know, used notion or thought that immigrants were dirty. So on film, you make them clean, God-fearing, and hardworking people. All right, so I've taken you through the 1939 uh, legislation to establish the NFB, and now I want to indicate the 1950 Act the revised NFB Act, and here's the legislation. To promote, distribute, produce films designed to interpret Canada to Canadians and to other nations. Well, as I've just explained, they were already, the board films were already interpreting Canada. They simply weren't explaining um, ways uh, that Canadians could understand, Canadians who did not travel very far in those years. So what happens in mid 20th century, 1950 specifically, the Massey Commission is created. It's the first formal view, review I should say, of post-war Canadian arts and culture. And one of the concerns among many was the influence of American movies in uh, theaters, in theater chains particularly. And so the recommendation, one of them, of the Massey Commission was to expand the role of the film board. And here you see an image of um, famous players, Marquis and the royal couple. That is Princess Elizabeth around age 26 and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. They made a five week tour of Canada from one end of the country to the other. And that film was a highly received and enjoyed film. It really ensured that the NFB's longevity would be secure to a certain degree. The film was beautifully shot with Eastman color. And so when you look at that film today, and you can do that on the NFB um, website, uh, you will see how stable the color is. When the princess visits Washington near the end of the film and then returns to Canada in order to return to Britain. Her gorgeous red coat couldn't be redder. It's beautiful. So the stability of, of color and Eastman color was really important. Famous players agreed um, to uh, show this film, screen this film in their theaters across the country and also the film was screened in the, Amer in the US. As a matter of fact, over a thousand theaters screened this film in Canada for over a year in famous players theaters. So that's quite extraordinary. Um, the accompanying narration on the film is the weakest thing because the princess and her husband came here uh, to Canada in um, October and for a Christmas release or pre-Christmas release, there was a real rush at the board to get the narration done, and there's some clumsy moments, but it's still an amazing film. What else happens in the 1950s? The portability of lightweight cameras and sound recorders, as you see in this image of Quebec filmmakers. 
So this is a breakthrough for filmmakers in so-called English Canada and in Quebec to be able to go out into the regions to film people, not from the centralized perspective, but from <clears throat> the locales. 1960s, there's a decentralization of the NFB with local film production with a regional focus. In the 1970s, there's a women's filmmaking unit established. And in 1980 to 80s to 1990s, indigenous filmmaking. And here you see an image of Alanis Obamsawan's 1993 film, Kanasataki. 270 years of resistance. So filmmakers of color were making documentaries on black subjects and communities, and documentaries were being made on immigrants and immigration. All right, let's get pointed and specific here on the three selected film board documentaries focused on regional Canada and black regional Canada particularly. You've been able to see this on the nfb.ca website. The first film I'll talk about is Journey to Justice 2000, about injustices in Canadian society and good citizenship. Remember Africville 1991 focuses on the destruction of a very important Halifax black community. And Speak It from the Heart of Nova Scotia, 1992, is concerned with the rising up of black youth. So let's begin with Journey to Justice, and you see the poster on, on the uh, screen. Journey to Justice is anchored by a man named Stanley Grizel, the first black citizenship judge in Canada. And he was once a CN train porter. He knows Canada from the ground up. So the ethic in the film, uh, from in his words, as he speaks to the uh, people he bids into Canadian citizenship, is about, quote unquote, representing all races. Above all, respect cultures around you. And he talks about the new picture of enlightened immigration, that is the 1992 policy in immigration. Of course, the irony here, and the irony isn't in the film, the irony is in us viewing this film now, is that the multi multicultural society has a racist past. The structure of this documentary is a very common film board um, format. It's a compilation film. Archival materials from many archives and the voices and stories told of racist experiences in other words, the past is recollected in the present. In urban centers, there are memories of the refusal of accommodation in a Toronto hotel, the refusal of a drink in a bar in the Montreal Forum, and in Halifax, so much more. Now, it also focuses this film on racism in small town Ontario, specifically Dresden, Ontario but name your town. There was a color ban in a local cafe by the owner. This was also a place, Dresden, where racist minstrel shows were performed and enjoyed by locals in churches and schools. And that was also true here in Niagara Falls uh, with a slim black community, but a lot of racist minstrel shows being performed and enjoyed. Also in Dresden, in schools, there was concern with racist literature, but it took a long time for that concern to be addressed. For example, the, one of the popular stories in books in schools was the story of Little Black Sambo, written in 1899 by a Scott woman, Helen Bannermint, who lived and was entertaining her children when she wrote this in uh, colonial India. Worse is the 1935 cartoon, which eventually was banned, but shown in schools then, of uh, an animation of the story of Little Black Sambo. Sambo. The grotesque animation is extraordinary. 
there's a rotund mammy mother and she is scrubbing on a scrub board, little black sandal, hard, the suds are flying as if to rub his color out of him. Notion, the clean black person again. The uh, Helen Bannimer's illustration in the original book, the story of little black sandal, all, sandal also have these grotesque illustrations of blacks with exaggerated features, just like the minstrel shows would also do. A female narrator in this film, Journey to Justice, talks about discrimination in Canada, Canada being de facto. De facto means in fact or in effect. In other words, practices, not the law, and the permission, therefore, that you may discriminate. And Viola Desmond's sisters, they re recollect her arrest at the Roseland Cinema in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. There had been no formal rules on segregated seating, but the discretion was up to the management to not allow her to sit in the orchestra section of the theater in this little place. Blacks had to sit in the balcony. She refused, was arrested. And so Viola Desmond, long after her death, was given what's known as the Viola Desmond par uh, Pardon by Nova Scotia in 1965. And here you see the stamp in her honor from 2012 and also the $10 bill issued in 2018. In the film Journey to Justice, one of the speakers is an Olympic sprinter from the past. He talks about everyone being equal on the track, but he could not get any coaching jobs after his track, track career. He says, I started to realize I was black and very particularly when he became aware of the Ku Klux Klan cross burning in Hamilton and the robes of the Klansmen had badges of the maple leaf on them. So I would characterize this film, Journey to Justice, as a tribute film, and it's in the dedication at the end of the film, dedicated to the many individuals and organizations who strove to serve human and civil rights for all Canadians. The director, Roger McTair, was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad, Tobago. This film is a throwback to the film board's long time mandate over 80 years to explain Canada to Canadians and to interpret Canadian injustices, this time from black perspective. All right, let's go on to the next film. The film is Remember Africville, director Sheila McKenzie, 1991. The film is an outgrowth of an exhibit and conference that was held at Mount St. Vincent University in 1991. It's a very simple structure and camera setup. It films a public forum about the deconstruction or the destruction of Africville. On the panel is the Halifax mayor of the time, a human rights advocate, and a civil rights representative representative who remembers Africville. The visual proof in the film are the many archival images, images and the film footage on the destruction of Africville. How did this come about? Well, in 1964, there was a decision by city fathers to relocate Africville residents to Halifax public housing. In the simple structure, Listening to the panel is an audience made up of former residents of Africville. They're resigned to listening to stories about and justifications that are coming from the panel about their former community located on the Bedford Basin in Halifax Port. These were tax paying owners but with no city services, no sewers, no running water. The archival footage of bulldozing houses was 
thinking is just a, quite extraordinary. Witnesses recall homes being demolished on the very day that people were moved out, belongings carted in city garbage trucks. It's extraordinarily demeaning. The church in Africville was the last building demolished, done at night under cover of darkness. This is a grim record of relocation, of the loss of a black community, and with it, the loss of dignity. There are tears, stories, and regret. A weary man says, Africville was my universe. So what happened to Africville in 1964 and is being recalled in this film of 1991 is known as structural racism. Structural racism. In other words, demolition that was influenced by 1960s to 1970s urban renewal theory. The rationale also came from the notion of human rights betterment. And they, these are echoes of Martin Luther King's work in the US, but here applied to Nova Scotia's black population. I think we need to keep in mind Nova Scotia's historical roots, black loyalist settlers in the 1780s, black refugees, the War of 1812, and Caribbean immigrants in the 1920s. And white settlers' views of black ref refugees and settlers were commonly the same, that they were inferior people. So they were pushed to the social margins. Therefore, black people formed their own communities. In Africa, in Africville, stores, schools, post office, and a church. There's a memorial roll call of sur surnames of Africville residents over archival footage at the end of the film of Rubble Site. And we hear someone in the modern day say, we have the responsibility to keep this memory alive in this annual reunion every, for three days in this grassed over site that once was Africville. You smell the salt water air. The final sound in the film is of a train, and the train ran through Africville. Railway porters lived here. I want to take a little aside here, an important aside on the train in Canadian history. The train in Canadian history is a metaphor of Canadian unity, the last spike banged out in 1885, that is the CPR. Here we see CPR laborers, and here we see the Canadian via rail train with the Rockies behind, a view that the laborers at the time never got to enjoy. We see the train is the CN train. We see the travel and connection and the issues of racism on CN trains. Railway porters were known generically by white travelers by the name George. They were treated like the equipment by railway management. And there was a breakthrough in the unionization of porters. That is the Canadian Brotherhood of Railway Employees that would not allow black people to become members in April 1917, the porters began to organize their own union, the Order of Sleeping Car Porters, the first black labor union in North America, established in Winnipeg. The union had to overcome the racism of the Canadian National CR, CNR management, which viewed black people as a cheap and disposable pool of labor who did not deserve job protections. In the closing narr narration of the film, we hear this, and it's about the never-ending vigilance that's still required. In 1990, the Africville Genealogy Society prepares to fight City Hall, Halifax City Hall, voted to construct an industrial service road to run alongside Seaview Park. 
their proposed route would cross over the foundation of the Seaview Baptist Church. So the memory of Africville in this film is both historical and mythological. We can learn beyond the film that famous visitors like boxer Joe Lewis came there in 1960s. The jazz musician Duke Ellington visited his father-in-law in Africville. Numerous books have been written on Africville, novels, memoirs, studies, and a children's book. And jazz musician Joe Seeley's father, who was a railway porter, was from Africville. And here is the album, album cover of his jazz suite album, 1996, known as the Africville Suite. And it won the 1997 Juno for the best contemporary jazz album. So it wasn't until 2010, the year 2010, that there was one of those formal apologies. We hear, we've heard many apologies from different levels of government on past wrongs done to segments of the Canadian population. This formal apology came from the city of Halifax in 2010. It's known as the Africville Apology. So in summing up this film, I want to say that Africville, it follows the film board tradition of explaining Canada, and there's a degree of lamenting in the film through regional voices and lens. It's not revolutionary filmmaking by any means but it's instructive. We have a black filmmaker behind the camera and the narrator, and I only learned that this was a black woman by doing extra research, of course, as one always does. The narrator is, uh, was, and perhaps still is, the executive director of the Council of African Canadian Education. Now the credits in these films become very important because they show us what kind of resources are out there that focus and have developed um, important uh, places to um, keep together the regional culture of Black Canadians. So we see thanks in the credits to the Africville Genealogy Society, the Black Cultural Centre, and uh, the managing imprint, in other words, of local back hi Black history in Nova Scotia. Okay, now to the third film in this group of three. Speak It from the Heart of Nova Scotia, 1992, director Sylvia Hamilton, 28 minutes. This film won the best Atlantic documentary in the Atlantic Film Festival in 1993. At the Geminis, these are the, were uh, the Canadian Screen Awards at the time. It won a multicultural award and the film was broadcast on CBC Nova Scotia, TV Ontario, and across Canada. The focus in the film is black students, and particular, particularly black racial identity and safety at risk. These students are concerned and express their concern about the racist graffiti on the washroom walls in their primarily white high school. They are activists, black students, and they organize to be heard, to be respected. And here you see this wonderful image of the cast. They enact a peace and justice march. We're not taken seriously. We're not taken seriously. Almost everybody is white, the teachers, white history. These are the faces and voices not reflected, they say in television, and they are right in literature. This is what's known as institutional racism. What does your school look like? And the key, one of the key voices in the film, this young 16-year-old male student named Shingai, he's a central questioning voice. He says, we need to know things that the school doesn't teach. For example, colonial history and African roots which in the film are dramatized for the rest of the student population on stage. 
Black Journey is the name of the play they enact by a local writer-director, David Woods, poet, artist, playwright, arts organization organizer, and mentor to his students. So instead of acting out in the streets, they act out on stage as theater. They go to a weekend conference, these students, these black students. There are breakout sessions and discussions about identity and labeling. They go to see, in the local theater, Spike Lee's film, feature film, Jungle Fever, 1991, about an interracial couple. This prompts a discussion on racial mixing, and there are voices for and against black and white relationships, particularly marriage. So today, and again, I found this out by doing some research well beyond the film, today, that once young activist Shingai is a support services caseworker in Nova Scotia. So you can see how he has translated and transferred his activism in his adult life and work. Again, the credits here are important. Thanks to regional resources, they reflect historical consciousness, the culture, cultural awareness youth group in Nova Scotia, the Black Cultural Society in Nova Scotia, the Public Archives in Nova Scotia, and CBC Halifax. The film board developed a comprehensive educational kit around this film, Speak It. In this kit, there are assignments and discussions that can be uh, conducted by teachers and students on racism incorporated into the school curriculum. This can be done today. And so this is about the continuing role of the NFB as an institution to again explain, interpret Canada. And I want to say to prop up its institutional role with these kinds of educational kits. So I want to summarize here on the film board and its work. These three films are timely in their day and their subject matter is still very important. I'm going to call them social problem documentaries on the legacy of racism in Canada. They reflect the film board's institutional challenges to remain relevant by showing and telling regional stories. Why would the NFB need to remain relevant? Well, extreme budget cuts over the decades, waning staff, waning energy. It's very hard to keep the film board together, though it has been that way for over 80 years. So th this is in the wake of past revolutionary filmmaking and documentaries from the 50s and 60s. So while these films, these three films, in the period they were produced, what was going on in feature filmmaking? Quite extraordinary stuff. Quebec's Denis Arcand had made The Decline of the American Empire, 1986. Clement Virgo, Jamaican-born, made the film feature documentary uh, feature film rude in 1995 the narrative is set in region park in toronto so you can see how feature filmmaking was moving well past uh, the kind of more conventional documentary filmmaking that the board was doing and mostly continues to do so the history of the nfb is long over 80 years. That history is complicated by internal and external pressures. Once a pioneering documentary place of methods, the films have become more conventional in their structure, in their style. Which isn't to say their subject matters are not important, they are. The film board is a major archive on its own and cognizant of that status. It has been digitizing its collection for several years now, 
and those are available online, free, hundreds of films, easy to access to view at nfb.ca. Is there a teacher, past or current, who hasn't used NFB films as teaching tools, as available lessons and imagery for science projects, water, climate change, projects on indigenous peoples, projects on diversity? And I want to say, and I would like to encourage <laughs> people, all of you, to just look at the pure pleasure of certain acclaimed animation films that were made in the period 1939 to 45, propaganda films to sell victory bonds. And I suggest that you look at Norman McLaren, one of the world's great animators, winner of many Oscars and other awards. That's our talk from for tonight. I want to remind you that our next Movie Matters talk is in two weeks on Thursday, October 22nd at 7 p.m. right here from the museum. The subject is the biodrama titled The Loving Story about an interracial couple in the U.S. Meanwhile, please visit the traveling exhibition in the museum, North is Freedom. And for all details, check the museum website, niagarafallsmuseums.ca. Good night. Until next time.